We now turn to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was born about 65 years after Descartes died. So we've moved forward a century in time. That means that Rousseau was able to observe the existing scientific world. Descartes could only dream of it. He wanted it to happen, but he had to imagine what it might be like. Rousseau could look around and see what it was like. In Rousseau's day, the progress of science had energized European society and was the focus of most intellectual curiosity. And Rousseau was one of the first modern thinkers to dwell on the drawbacks and the defects and the cost of advances in science. He was not a conservative. There have, had always been conservative thinkers who didn't like the changes modern science was bringing and wanted to keep the world as it used to be. But those were weak voices when Rousseau was alive because they didn't have the excitement of the moderns who welcomed science. By the time Rousseau was alive, everyone could see the great power and, and appreciate that science had opened up the world to new knowledge and experiences. So Rousseau was not a conservative, he was a modern, but still he made the argument that progress in science meant losing more than the human race would gain. Rousseau was born in the city of Geneva in Switzerland, although he always had an attraction to French culture and a kind of fatal attraction to the glamour of a city such as Paris. But he was born in Geneva and always called himself a citizen of Geneva. Geneva was a Protestant country as opposed to Catholic France and it was a democracy of a kind as opposed to France, which had at the time a king. Now, the Protestant religion differed from the Catholic religion in putting in emphasis on the individual. The point was your reading of the Bible and your relationship to God and Jesus. The Catholic Church was much more involved in the church itself. You were a member of that church and lived in that body. Now, the democracy kept as its chief priority the freedom of their government. The Genevans were proud of being citizens no one ruled them, they ruled themselves, and they were willing and even eager to put in trouble and attention to make that happen. Descartes, you may remember, liked the city of Amsterdam because everyone leaves you alone. They're all interested in their private business. Politics is not so important there. Everybody just wants to go to work. But the citizens of Geneva had an opposite understanding. The great thing was that they put their time on the public business rather than private business, and that was how they maintained their freedom, which they valued more than wealth and power. They thought that a luxury and a show of wealth, wearing very expensive clothes, say, was a suspicious habit. Not something good and charming, but something to make you wonder what sort of vice and lack of virtue was being hidden behind that wealth. That, in any way, is Rousseau's understanding of the character of the citizens of Geneva. So that's what counts for us. Now, Rousseau himself was only sometimes like this. He did admire all those qualities, but he was seduced and, and attracted to many of the opposite things. As I said, he was very interested in French society, which to him meant the opposite, was the place of 
good taste and refinement and great luxury. Rousseau was a social human being, much more than Descartes. Descartes, you will remember, tells the story of his greatest day when he's snowed in and spends the whole day alone in a room with nobody to bother him. He's just free to think his thoughts. That was not Rousseau's idea of happiness. He wanted to be with others. And he wrote about many of the same things as Descartes does, did, but he's much more interested in politics uh, and the arts, which are both things one does with other people. Now, Rousseau then had a divided character. He was drawn to the strict morals of Geneva, but also to the wonderful attractions of society. And much of his thinking comes out of the tension, the war that was going on within himself between those two attractions. The book we're reading tries to show the reader how to recognize that many social goods are merely conventionally good. They're not really good. They only seem to be good or are accepted as good by other people. Much of what Rousseau wrote was meant to show the reader how to recognize the falseness of those goods and to come back to something natural and virtuous instead. Now, the book we are starting to read was an essay in response to a prize offered by the Academy of Dijon in France, a scientific society. The Academy set this essay for a prize and Rousseau won the prize. You will notice that the topic is the one that we have just been discussing through Descartes. Descartes would have looked at this question and answered, yes, advances in science have exactly purified our morals by taking out what was wrong-headed of morals in the past and directing morals toward their object of having helping other people and so making them more pure. Rousseau faces the same question and says, no, the exact opposite has happened. The sciences haven't purified our morals, they have corrupted our morals. And it's the work of our next four classes to try to understand his argument to that conclusion. I'm going to turn past the preface in the first section to the main argument to the start of the first part on page 34. If you take a moment and read over this paragraph, you will probably be reminded of part five of Descartes' discourse. Rousseau is talking about the same thing. Human beings in the modern century have looked at the whole universe of the whole heavens and also looked within ourselves. And we do it with understanding and intelligence. And that is something very impressive. Here's the next paragraph. Rousseau is clearly a modern. He appreciates the advances of the modern century and doesn't want to go back to the old ways. That is not his critique. You may remember this paragraph as the one that insults Muslims, and I hope you're not insulted by that, or maybe I should say you can go ahead and be insulted. I just hope you're not so mad that you close your mind to the argument. The critique is subtler and more paradoxical than it seems at first. This is, in fact, the paradox of the whole argument. What is he saying? Muslims were uneducated, but... Education in Rousseau's world is not a good thing, it's a bad thing, it's a kind of corruption. Uh, what you have instead of education is virtue and strength. The Muslims, because they didn't care about letters, that is, writing and education, 
they were strong enough to conquer the world and therefore cast away the thing that they weren't interested in, the writings that they had borrowed from the ancient Greeks and Romans. Europeans took that education up and it was like a virus. It weakened and destroyed them. That is the central paradox of the argument. So you can get mad at the insult, but you have to understand the insult in those terms.